Good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices. Our first item of business this morning is to decide whether to take items 4, 5, 6 and 7 in private. Are members agreed? Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business this morning is to take evidence from the Chair and members of the Scottish Fiscal Commission in relation to its report on forecasts for the devolved taxes and for non-domestic rates. I therefore would like to welcome to the meeting uh, Lady Susan Rice, CBE, Professor Campbell Leith and Professor Andrew Hughes-Hallett. Uh, committee members have copies of the Commission's report, so we will go straight to questions from the committee. And as is a custom on, on the committee, I'll ask some questions first and um, members can come in subsequently if there's any questions left to ask. I try not to steal all the good ones at the start, you know. <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay, then, um, the, um, the, part, uh, uh, the Commission uh, describes its approach to consideration of the government's uh, forecast as one of, and I quote, inquiry and challenge, followed by response, followed by further inquiry and suggested improvements. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, whether you intend to publish details of this inquiry and challenges recommended by the committee. Let me let me respond in the first instance, and I'll turn to my colleagues. Are you happy if the three of us have a conversation with you? I mean, I'll, yes. I, I mean, I should have actually made that clear at the yes. start. It's, uh, what, what I should have said is that either one or more people can comment. It's Thank not you. all directed at, at yourself, Lee Rice. It could be, um, you know, you can answer, and if your colleagues wish to answer, that's great. It's, it may be that you don't wish to answer at all certain questions, and other colleagues maybe uh, it may be more appropriate to refer them. Uh, to the, the professors on either side of you, so yeah, it's absolutely. Up to you. <laughs> Are you um, but that's that's very helpful. But I'll I'll at least start off in response to this question. Um, those were my words. Um, you know, as we, we three drafted our report, um, but we had different bits in different sections, and then made it one voice. We hope, uh, and we were simply trying to, or I was simply trying to reflect uh, the nature of how we did things um, with some other fiscal bodies in, in other countries and other places. They actually look at um, forecasts after the fact, for instance. Our job is to look before the fact. Uh, and it was really to point out that, that you know, the nature of what we're doing. We started uh, once the um, uh, forecasters were ready uh, in the latter part of the summer, having a presentation from them on their approach to their forecasting, their models, and so forth. And so inquiry and challenge was a matter of asking a lot of questions, uh, saying, you know, what do you mean by this? Have you considered this? Have you considered that? Out of all of that kind of to toing and froing, um, we ultimately drew some of our conclusions. For instance, one of the conclusions that is very clear in the report is that um, new taxes uh, and not the you know decades of historic data and uh, and that's a challenge and, and data is a is an issue so um, out of the inquiry and the challenge came some of our conclusions um, it, so it, in a summary sense the nature of that was really encompassed in the report um, if you're asking would we publish something more specific um, if you tell us what you'd like, we can do it. So if you'd like, for instance, um, a summary um, of meetings or conversations we had with the economic forecasters, um, we can prepare something of that sort if you'd like that. Mm -hmm. But we felt that we had reported overall on the, um, the, the nature of how we worked, which was to challenge beforehand, and the, the results from the, all those conversations were the results that we, in the conclusions we put in our report. And I think the point to ask here is, did your forecast change as a result of this inquiry and challenge? Well, we're not forecasting. I know, I know uh, so, you, no, yeah. but your, your assessment of the forecast, I should say, because quite clearly there are two different forecasts. There's the one uh, which the Scottish Government has made, in, for example, on new, new taxes, uh, etc., and there's the one uh, which the, the OBR has made, and there's, as you know, a £51 million differential in that. So it's to see whether your, your assessment of these forecasts changed. Um, our understanding of the... Uh, maybe that's the best way, and I will ask my two colleagues, uh, because they each focus on each took a, a tax primarily, although we shared all of this. This was very much a committee effort at the end of the day. Um, but certainly our understanding of um, what was happening changed absolutely as we had the, as we had the conversation and uh, conversations. And 
um, some of the economists went back and came back to us to answer more questions, to give us more information as we delved into it. Um, but in terms of our, our assessment, we started by, by finding out. We didn't start by saying, this is good or bad. Um, we started by saying, help us understand what you've done. You can't start any other place. Uh, so I would, I would maybe not answer your question in exactly the words you posed it, but let me turn to either of my colleagues there. Yeah, I think well, <coughs> the, the, the kind of nature of inquiry and, and so on it took several forms. So not only were there kind of written submissions from the government to us and then queries written uh, in response, we, we also had meetings which essentially took the form of an academic seminar. So people were asked points of clarification during presentation of their of their forecasting methods, and then there was a, a long series of questions afterwards. We, we also received the spreadsheets containing the models from the Scottish Government, so in a sense that's all part of the inquiry process, even although we weren't specifically asking Scottish Government economists at that point, we were just looking through the models our, ourselves. So, so there's a wide range of activities taking place in terms of uh, in terms of the inquiries that went on. Uh, and the initial part of that was not so much reviewing forecasts, because they weren't finalised at that point, but was exploring methods. So uh, the large chunk of the initial part of our inquiry is looking at, well, how do you propose to forecast in, in a general sense? What kind of underlying methods, what techniques, what models have you built? to enable you to do that, and that's the bulk of the inquiry was focused on that. And then relatively late in the, state, late in the process, the, the forecasts are finalised, and then we look at those in light of the discussion over methods that, that's taken place. Mm. Yes, and you were saying that, you're, you're, you, you know, that the, how things develop changed quite considerably during that kind of process, you know, your, your, your view of how it was all, all came together. I wonder if you can give us a bit more detail on that, Lady Rice. How things develop. I think that the quickness was that there wasn't a big window of opportunity for any of us to actually come together, understand this, and for us to produce our uh, report. So it was a very intense period, um, but it wasn't over many months, obviously. We were only formed uh, basically in, in July when we had our letters of appointment. Um, so uh, help me when you ask that. Yeah, yeah, kind of, I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember the specific words that you used, actually. Sorry. I'm trying to uh, find that in the depths of my short-term memory, which <laughs> perhaps isn't as as it should be. But you, you, you talked, you were just basically saying how, the, the, you know, the, 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 what you looked at at the beginning of the inquiry um, is not really... The way you explored it kind of changed a wee bit, evolved uh, kind of over the, over the period. Yes, sorry. So let me make that clear if I haven't done so. We started out by needing to understand from the forecasters um, what models that we, they were using, how they were approaching the forecast, what they, you know, just how they were coming at it to begin with. We couldn't really make a judgment about how reasonable their forecast would be once we saw them um, unless we understood the you know, their approach to it. So that was the early part of our engagement. Uh, and um, and then, as Campbell has just said, laterally, when they had more or less concluded their forecasts, we then looked at those and needed, obviously, to make the judgment about whether they were reasonable or not. You'll have seen our conclusions in the report. Um, and uh, it, obviously, uh, in one area, um, we pointed out that the, um, the forecasts was within the bounds of reasonableness, if you will, but quite optimistic, and that was responded to. So mm -hmm. um, that was the the outcome of the second phase when we actually applied what we knew about their models and their approach to their forecasts. Is that clear? Sorry, if I'm not making it clear. I think it's me that's not so clear rather than yourself, but I'll, I'll move on a bit. But, um, uh, I, I'm just wondering, I mean, throughout your report you've talked about data, and obviously there's a frustration, the committee shared this frustration for a long period of time, about the kind of sources and the quality of data that's available, uh, specifically to look at um, Scottish figures uh, being able to drill down. But I'm just wondering, you know, that being said, whether, um, you know, all the information you considered necessary for your report was made available in good time by Scottish, the Scottish Government. The point about data is a very important one, and, and I referred to it just uh, you know a minute ago when I answered your first question, and it is that these are new taxes or taxes with a new shape, um, and uh, there is not um, a, a long uh, 
history of data that could feed into the models that the forecasters were using. That's what, um, and my two colleagues will tell you, that's what economists want. They want a long series of data because that means that they are more comfortable with the forecast that, uh, that they come out with. Uh, given that fact, um, we and the uh, economists uh, had a lot of conversation about uh, what data they had, what the sources were, w was there anything better, um, were people cooperating with them when they went to acquire data, was this the best that they had, and so forth. Um, and then perhaps two other comments, and I might turn to maybe Andrew to, to add a little more on this. One comment is that um, we've also, I've prompted a series of meetings with some of the agencies which provide data and have started providing data to the government economists. Um, and the point, of, and the, those conversations are ongoing. So for instance, SEPA, um, I um, have a, a further meeting coming up, having had a couple already, Revenue Scotland, registers of uh, Scotland, and so on. And it's for us actually to understand um, how willing and, and happy and, and responsive they have been. We make our own judgment about that. But certainly um, there has been absolute willingness that we could judge on all sides in terms of the sources of data. But what you have from the work that the OBR has done in the past, and you can understand why this would be the case, they have in some instances gathered data and then made an, a proportional cut and applied that to Scotland. Um, that is not the same as having Scottish only data. And that's where we all want to be. It could not be the case in this first round. Um, so so I, I just want to make that point. Um, the other point is that we had amongst ourselves a great deal of debate, uh, some of it well into the night sometimes, um, about um, uh, what do you do then as, as, an, as, a, as a forecaster and as an economic modeler uh, when you don't have a perfect data set, because actually life is rarely perfect, and you're often in situations where you don't have, um, and, and what are the best approaches and ways to deal with that. Andrew, do you want to say anything about that? I could do. Um, just going back to the beginning of that question, um, the, the reason why uh, you want long data series, if you can get it, is you're trying to look for some regularity in the data. And if you've only got a short period, you can't tell whether it's just noise a variation or whether there's something regular in there. <clears throat> so it's important to go back as far as you possibly can. And it takes a while to discover uh, sometimes uh, whether the data does go back in time and you didn't know or uh, it's, it's been hidden somewhere. So, for example, we've discovered that uh, the housing data from Register Scotland potentially goes back to 1617 or something. It goes, it goes a long way back, but it's very patchy, but as you could put it. Very patchy. Very patchy. It's, it's, it's <laughs> apparently pretty good back to 2003. Uh, and then you come up and say, well, how good is that? You know, how, how much regularity can you get out of that? And um, in other cases, you know, it's, it's obvious that you want some, again, in housing, you want some uh, financial data or something of this kind, uh, maybe of a sort that doesn't exist at all. Or as Susan just said, it may exist, but only at the UK level. And the problem with that is you take a Scottish cut, that may be the best you can do uh, in, in, uh, up until now, uh, until you collect some of your own or, or find some other way of doing it. Um, but, of course, it's going to reflect the rest of UK um, conditions rather more than the Scottish conditions. So in housing, you know, numbers may get blown apart because of the London effect. Um, and uh, you're left saying, well, is that cut good enough? Or is there some other way we can make an assumption which we believe takes the London effect out, but we, we won't actually be sure until we can look in a post-mortem sense to see how well it did. So... Uh, that's a very long way of saying inevitably there's compromise when you do this. The things you do, you, you know how you would like to do it ideally, then you discover you can't do it ideally, and the question is how far are you prepared to compromise? And I think the, the um, methods that the Scottish Government of people have used up until now are reasonable. That's not to say they couldn't be improved, and I think our job for the next year coming is to see what we can yes. do to, 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 to get them to improve which is going to be, a, excuse the phrase, but a bit touchy-feely as to, as to how you can uh, um, sensibly go forward, whether it's reliable. Okay. Now, I mean, I mentioned earlier that the, in terms of devolved taxes, the difference in terms of forecast between the OBR and the Scottish Government is about the order of 51 million, uh, 558 million, as opposed to 609 million. I'm just wondering wh which of these th you think is the most accurate? I, I, I don't know. 
try and answer that one. Yeah, essentially, there's, there's a kind of continuum of ways of, of forecasting, and the Scottish Government and the OBR are really at opposite extremes of that continuum. So the OBR has you know, a large macroeconometric model with hundreds of equations describing all aspects of the economy, and that's largely because they have to forecast all macro variables plus the whole range of fiscal variables that they're interested in. So that's the, the bulk of their work is focused on that. And in forecasting the devolved taxes, they then tend to look at, given the limited data there is, they tend to apportion some kind of share uh, of UK projections to Scotland, which may be even just a historical average, but it may have some slight drift in it. Uh, the Scottish Government, on the other hand, have looked at each tax kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, and they've used what data they have for that tax, and they've built small, simple kind of statistical sometimes, or sometimes simply extrapolation based on historical data to project those variables forward. So it's completely different approaches. It's not obvious which one is going to produce the best forecast. There's horse races between these forecasting techniques conducted in the literature. And it's not automatic that having a big 100 equation model is going to dominate a simple statistical analysis. So no one approach is better than the other. But essentially, it's fundamentally different ways of doing it. In terms of specific taxes, uh, well, I think the, the land and buildings transactions tax are forecast to be slightly higher under the, the OBR's forecast than the Scottish government's. But the OBR is using kind of UK-wide projections, which has a, a more buoyant housing market than, than Scotland does. And they're shading those down a little bit for Scotland's share, but not to the extent that it appears the Scottish Government is doing implicitly by building up from Scottish data. So it's, it's these kind of fundamental differences in the way they're doing Yeah, I mean, I know about the fundamental differences. This is what, I mean, you, were, you know, your can answer was almost how long is a piece of string, to be honest. I mean, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, one of the things, obviously, we're quite keen to know is, is, is you know, which forecast you think would be more accurate. I mean, the, 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 there's a difference of some 15% in terms of residential transactions. Uh, for the OBR, there's a 9% difference in landfill tax, so there's quite, these are quite substantial, proportionate differences now. These are fairly small taxes, but obviously if we go forward in terms of other devolved taxes, you know, such differences will be very significant. That's why I think we're quite keen to get the most accurate forecasting and to get your assessment of which forecast would be able to deliver the most accurate um, you know, prediction of, 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 of where we are, really. In order to do that, you, you really need to, be, well, you need to attach what are called standard errors to these forecasts, which neither forecaster currently does. It's very difficult to do with large-scale macroeconometric models. The Scottish Government has insufficient data to build statistical models that can assess the statistical accuracy of their forecasts either. But if you look at something like the, the Bank of England's forecasts, where they do have sufficient data and a small-scale model, they can attach errors to their forecasts, which is how they produce their fan charts, which forecast inflation and the upper and lower bounds for that. My conjecture would be that if you attached similar, if you drew similar fan charts for these doing proper statistical analysis, the fan charts would get wide very quickly and would encompass both sets of forecasts. They're not statistically different. They look largely different, but statistically they're not different. Okay. Could I add just a, a very small point? In, in one instance where there really isn't a, a lot in terms of bulk, a lot of Scottish data, the Scottish uh, economists took a three-year, kind of a three-year average, which is a very sensible approach. So they were quite conscious of the limitations of the restricted data they had. I saw that in your report. Now, I just want to touch on one other thing, because obviously I want colleagues around the table to have an opportunity as well. And that's on the issue of uh, non-domestic rates. And you talk about buoyancy. You suggest that they are on the uh, optimistic uh, side. Uh, indeed, uh, Mr Swinney has reduced his forecast by £83.5 million. Pounds. But, um, and you also say that in noting that um, NDRI revenues are f five to six times larger than land building transaction tax or... Um, so, um, um, landfill, uh, yes, uh, landfill tax campaign. The, the Commission states that it would pay to make them as reliable as possible, as quickly as possible. Now, the reason, uh, and to, to my mind, I, I, I'm not really sure why you're, you're suggesting that, because uh, what Mr Swinney said on the 10th of um, October when he actually presented the draft budget was that... Uh, 
Um, since 2008, some £13.1 billion pounds has been collected in NDRI, and, and yet the variance has only been £40 million pounds cumulatively, which is 0.3%. Now, surely that shows that, I mean, you were saying, for example, Professor Leith, you know, that, that, that within, the, within the margins of error, when we're talking about a difference between the OBR and the Scottish Government of some 15% and some LBTT predictions, and yet on NDRI we're talking about... Um, only a 0.3 percent um, variance in delivery. So, so why, are you, why as a, as a group, are you so uh, concerned about this particular issue? Do you? Yeah, I can respond. I can respond. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's essentially the, the, the taxis are taxis on different types of activity. So, the kind of land and buildings transactions tax and the landfill tax are kind of taxis on transactions, whereas the non-domestic rates. Uh, is, is essentially a tax on the stock of rateable floor space. And so the thing that's essentially changing in the forecast are the changes in rateable value floor space, which is new business premises coming online and so on. So that, I guess that's why the forecast is... It's, uh, essentially, the forecasters are having to forecast the change in domestic rates rather than the level of domestic rates. So perhaps our report is slightly misleading in suggesting that there's volatility in the, in the aggregate level uh, of that. It's, it, essentially, the, we should have compared the change in domestic rates, tax revenues to the tax revenues from the other, uh, the other taxes in terms of looking at accuracy of forecasts. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> um, it may have been 0.3 of a percent, but it's quite a lot of pounds. It's a much larger tax, and that's why uh, we would be concerned about it. So I think you said it, and, and I'm picking up behind the times here slightly, but you said it was about 40 billion? 40 million out of a 13.1 billion is some over uh, six years. Now, in that yeah. time, we've had recession and all the rest of it, and yet the accuracy of the figures, is, I think it's quite remarkable to be able to predict such figures within 0.3%. Yeah, but, but um, that's over a number of years, and presumably, I mean, I don't have the individual figures through the individual years, but they may cancel out. Mm. And there may be quite a lot of variability year by year, and of course we're forecasting for one particular budget. Mm. So that's why, I mean, it, 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 you can also get lucky. In yeah. this case, perhaps unlucky. I'm not sure which one it was. But, but so that's why um, we're concerned with it. And, and it's potentially quite a large number of pounds but is there any year when it's been particularly way out the predictions, you know, when Mr Swinney's predicted being significantly higher than in actual fact the sum delivered? Because I'm not aware that that has been the case. Uh, no, I, I don't know the numbers. We don't, we don't have those numbers. We don't have um, those numbers. But that, that will bear looking at, and you're pointing us to some, as we work on our work plan for the coming 12 months, that's a point that we'll definitely pick up. Uh, we certainly need to go back into... Um, as I say, during the post-mortem on all, all three taxes, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, to see how well they performed. Mm -hmm. um, this took quite a long time. We, we had to do it in a month. <laughs> so if you wanted to come and join us at midnight... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we, we, we all we, appreciate we that what you're doing. We, we do appreciate that. I mean, I'm not trying but to... It, but, I mean, you're putting your finger on the right thing. We need to look back and say sure. um, how well did they perform. I mean, that, that phrase you picked out is actually mine, and I'm concerned with the size of the, the impact or potential impact mm -hmm. on the budget. And it is a lot larger, potentially. OK. Uh, well, thank you for that. Well, I'm, I'm going to let your colleagues come in. And the first person to ask questions is going to be Jamie, to be followed by John. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, thank you very much for uh, the work you've uh, done. Uh, as a, a commission, uh, you have been able to endorse as reasonable a forecast made by the Scottish Government. And that basis, I just want to return just very briefly to uh, the issue that the conveners explored uh, in relation to the difference between the forecast of the Scottish Government and the forecast of the OBR. Uh, the conveners explored it quite thoroughly, but just for uh, absolute clarity and just to go back to the uh, points that Professor uh, Leith was uh, making about the difference in terms of uh, forecast methodology, is the difference explained simply by the fact that the OBR comes to a UK assessment and they apportion uh, a, a proportionate a share of that to Scotland? Uh, largely, yes. That's the, the fundamental difference across the, the two approaches to forecasting. There are kind of other slight differences in using a, a three-year 
uh, kind of moving average as the, as the base year for forecasting non-residential transactions, whereas the OBR doesn't do that. So there's kind of other subtle differences. The landfill tax is based on DEFRA data for, or a DEFRA model for the OBR, but it's built up from SEPA data for Scotland. So there's, there's other small differences as well, but fundamentally the difference is the OBR uses a big macroeconometric model and then scales a portion of that for Scotland. The Scottish government economists start with a small set of data relating just to these taxes and forecast, roll that forward to forecast they, these taxes. And when they apportion a, a proportionate share, are they just doing it in terms of Scotland it's, equates to about just under 9% of the UK population? No, it's, no they, they, they have some historical data for the amount of tax revenues raised in Scotland for that particular tax relative to the rest of the UK. So they use those historical averages. They, they, in recent forecasts, they've been tweaking them slightly. For example, the UK housing market's more buoyant, so they've, they've reduced the share of stamp duty uh, land tax apportioned to Scotland based on the fact that the Scottish housing market has not been as buoyant as the rest of the UK, given the London effects. Although they, they still think it will be more buoyant than the Scottish Government it does, apparently. Uh, yep, yeah, so they, they, they haven't scaled it back. Mm. Okay. Um, just turning again, the, the, the issue that the, the convener uh, touched on as well, because it, it, it does come through as a, a, um, a major theme of your report, the, the frustration about not having access to uh, data. Um, it's also a frustration for you. You've set out that you know this is something that should improve over time, but I suppose it begets the question, how, how long will this period of time be? <laughs> that, that is how long is the is the piece of string? Absolutely, that's the question. Um, obviously, you know, 30 years from now there'll be a, a series of data that covers 30 years. So, I mean, that's how long. Um, maybe none of us would be sitting around this table at that point. Um, so, it, the real issue is um, to go in and do a kind of drains up just to see whether there was anything more that could have been done for this round to get more data, different data, get it differently or whatever. Um, and then it is to say, how does one accommodate in a forecasting sense to the fact that we have um, not the ideal set of data uh, and there are ways to, to do that. But um, forecasting isn't, uh, well, you all know this, it, you know, you, there is, you cannot predict the future. You just make your best shot at with what you have uh, coming out with a picture of what the future might look like. Um, so uh, the data will improve um, uh, in a specific way. Uh, I've had some conversations with SEPA. Um, they, uh, it looks to me, and I'm going out to test this in a, uh, on the ground, as it were, in a couple of weeks, but they will be much closer to the uh, landfill sites than obviously the OBR would ever have been able to be. Um, and so they will, in terms of the relationship of, of, of tax applied to what's going in, we believe that they will have very accurate um, and, and you know, truly on the ground uh, ability to, to reflect what, what is the real case. This isn't to fault one side or the other side about these differences. It's just the way it has been. So I think that the data will improve over time, but it will be a gradual improvement. Um, you know, we won't get the 30 years until 30 years are up. M maybe this is a question, maybe it's unfair to ask of you, and maybe you won't want to answer it, so you don't feel free to dodge it. But, I, I mean, do, we do well, <laughs> well, feel free to answer it if you want. Um, and you've not heard the question yet, and it's not that difficult a one, but I, I, something that's been suggested previously is there should be some sort of dedicated statistical agency for for Scotland, you know, looking at uh, data, not just the, in the area you're looking at, but on a much wider basis. Would, is that something you think that would be useful for you as a, a commission? It would be also useful for other public bodies, for the public at large, for us as parliamentarians? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Forecasters need data, uh, so it doesn't matter where it comes from. If a, if a new statistical agency would generate that data, then it's, it would be a good thing. Yeah. 
But, but you have something like registers of Scotland in their job is to hold and create data and analyze that data and so forth. So you'd have to at least ask the question. So I am avoiding giving you an answer, yes or no. But you'd have to ask the question, would there be an overlap with what is already done? And is what is already done sufficient? Is it good enough? Um, uh, or would it, an agency be uh, be helpful in that in that regard? Um, and, and maybe what, what we really need, though, is... I mean, o over time, these new taxes generate revenues. We'll have the data for that, so new, de new data will be being generated. But there must exist. There was transactions in the Scottish housing market before. There was landfill being sent to landfill sites and taxes being paid before. Uh, these transactions presumably are recorded somewhere. If they may not be easily accessible, but if that data still exists in some raw form uh, within existing bodies, then it would be good if those bodies could be encouraged to dig that data out and you know, create it in a usable form. Okay. So in my experience of this sort of thing, there's often more data there somewhere than you think. But of course, it's not until you get into one of these forecasting exercises, and this is for the first time it's being done, that you know what questions you want to ask. You know, I, want, I now know I want that kind of data as opposed to something else. So uh, there'll be improvements in that sense. And there will be improvements when you go over it two or three times. Uh, this is not 30 years, this is three years yeah. down the line. <coughs> um, when you refine the, if I can say, the ad, ad hocery, which is obviously in there to, with some of the variables. Um, so all of those things will happen quicker than other things. They won't be the perfect answer. Um, and on the statistical agency, I mean, I would have thought it would be useful in one sense, at least, whether you want to pay the money for a whole agency is another question, but uh, it would be useful in one sense because it would allow the focus to be on the, on the Scottish data. And to the extent that this is being derived from somewhere else, which may have been UK data and you're trying to carve it up and this sort of thing, um, giving a, an explicit focus like that would be helpful. Okay. And one last question. Mm -hmm. Convener, in your uh, uh, report, you say you welcome a feedback from any reader to the report, and that kind of turned my mind back. I think it was your point, Professor Leighton, maybe I've got the terminology right, but you talked about the whole idea of peer review, I think it, it was, and I'm just wondering if you've had any such feedback. Um, we have done an exercise to look at other fiscal commissions or similar bodies in other countries, and they are all slightly different. There isn't any one that you know, is absolutely like ours, but to see what they've done in terms of review. So the OBR is the one closest to, to our world, um, has had a review done by a Canadian um, with experience, uh, and I've read that. I think we've all, we've all had a look at that. That review was done five years in. Um, so that was a peer review, um, but obviously it gave the OBR the chance to establish itself, work out its its methods, um, have a little bit of opportunity to see did they get it right or wrong, did they change, did they adapt, and so forth. Uh, and we agree that there is absolutely uh, it's appropriate to have a peer review. Um, we've been two to three months in operation, so it wouldn't be happening in the next two or three months, I would guess. Um, having said that, um, but. Uh, when the report was published, um, I, I didn't, uh, we didn't send it out widely. We put it on our website so that, uh, and, and put out a little press notice so anyone who was interested could, could find it. But I did specifically send it to the OBR just to get a review there. And, uh, um, you know, and, and so we will, over time, as we continue these conversations with the other bodies and agencies with whom we have started to have a relationship, actually request some feedback and some input from them. Uh, over time, so it's good to get that sooner. But a formal peer review with capital letters, I think, would be some period down the line. I don't know exactly when, but yeah, I, I get maybe the, the formal I wasn't necessarily suggesting you'd have a, a formal peer review. It was just maybe, what, and, and you have you said you've sent it on the OBR and the rest, which yeah. essentially yeah. answered the question. But okay, people are are looking at this, and you are getting some feedback then. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and uh, and even from we've had meetings very recently with Revenue Scotland and with um, uh, registers of Scotland, and uh, and in those conversations there was uh, some feedback as well. Uh, so and we would welcome that. I mean, this is uh, as I said in it, it's a first for all of us. And the more that people kind of uh, come into the conversation and tell us what they think and what works and what's clear and what's not, the better we'll do it next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John, to be followed by Michael. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, there's obviously been quite a lot of questioning, and I suspect there will be on 
the kind of amount of data and availability of data and these kind of things. So continuing with that, I mean, in your comments under LBTT, the non-residential model, and your recommendations, you, you talk about uh, creating a new Scotland-specific data set may be the only reliable strategy. And then you say, which is the bit that worries me, that is neither a short-term nor cheap undertaking. And I suppose my question is, I mean, how do you decide? There, there must be a time when more data doesn't actually get you a better forecast. So spending money on getting more data would be a waste in that case. How do you decide how much data you need? And the point's been made that some data may be there, it's just not available. I mean, how, how do we balance that up? I guess there are lots of ways to, uh, to, to answer the question. Part of the answer, and then I'll turn to my expert colleagues um, for more of it, but part of it is um, the quality of the data you have. So it's partly the amount of data because models require volume. Uh, and that's very helpful, as Andrew's explained. But some of it is actually the, the quality of the data. How good, how specific is it? And there we do see um, a focus really beginning to happen and has started already in Scotland to get Scottish-specific data. That's really important. That means that the data we do have, even if it's limited in terms of bulk and volume, is perhaps better data, and that's important. But in terms of the, your direct question, you know, how much is enough and where does the you know, cost-benefit come in. I don't know if either Andrew or Campbell wants to say something, Andrew. Yeah, I guess. <clears throat> Sorry, a few things, I suppose. Um, I sub uh, you're right to pick on that particular element because I think that was one of the weakest parts of the forecast being made at the moment. <clears throat> the question is, um, if we do this properly, we would go back and say, what kind of model do we want? How would we, in principle, try and forecast this and then see what data that would demand and then discover, no doubt, that it didn't exist or we have to dig <laughs> not to, to find it. I'm not sure that we're going to do it, but, but uh, we can tell people uh, what to expect. Um, so it's a bit difficult to answer specifically ex ante um, because we haven't done that exercise and, and the Scottish Government people haven't done that exercise. Um, and at that point you discover, yes, we do desperately need Scottish-specific data. So we need to set up a project to do that, uh, which we might commission. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's how I would think about going about it. So starting at the model end, rather than saying, uh, you know, of all the <laughs> of all the data you can imagine that affects the non-residential sector, uh, what do we have? Okay. Um, I mean, another general kind of point. The, 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 the convener made the point earlier that actually the forecasts on, uh, I think it's a. Uh, uh, non-domestic rates income had um, been quite accurate over six years and I think yourself Professor Hallett made the point that there might be a lot of fluctuations within that. I mean is that actually important? I mean there's a clearly a borrowing limit and therefore if the fluctuations were too great it would affect the borrowing limit but in one sense we are more interested in that there should be a balanced budget or whatever over six years or, or whatever. Is the one year so important? Um. We are interested in a balanced budget over time. Um, I'm not sure that the Scottish Government's in a position to be interested in that because uh, they have to balance as best they can every year because they, they can't borrow effectively. Yes. And the amount of borrowing which is allowed under the current arrangements on um, current spending is scarcely visible to the naked eye. It's, it's a half a percent of GDP. It's tiny. Um, so they are actually constrained, and that's why I said that. If they were to go to a model in which they were asked to, to as a convention is, uh, to try and balance over the cycle, and forgetting the last financial crisis, which is a bit extreme, um, it would be a whole lot easier, and we would be interested in, in the performance exactly the way you say. Uh, but we need, uh, and to, I need actually to go back and check how much fluctuation there was year by year. Yeah, well, I've written that. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's a general point, that's a general answer. Okay, uh, and then my other question was really specifically on the, the landfill tax. Um, just one or two points kind of jumped out at me. Uh, I mean, one was that you noted that SEPA uh, rep are reporting data with a two-year time lag. That, that sounded a bit concerning. Can you comment on that? We just, uh, this was, came out of our exploring um, the sources of, of data. Uh, SEPA are, as you'll know, they have been changing uh, the way they're gathering the data on landfill. Um, they have actually something that uh, I think we all agree, I certainly think is very good because they'll be uh, looking, unlike the, the OBR, which just looks at landfill as reported and then 
uh, says, you know, the, the tax is such and such. Um, CEPA will be looking at illegal landfill, uh, you know, that where people have broken the rules, and there will be, in essence, as I understand it, um, a bigger a, a penalty, a, a bigger tax for doing that. So they're in the process of changing their approach. They have are, are and have been developing. Uh, an approach where they actually will go out and, and view and visit sites. I mean, all of this will will lead to some difference. So where they have been, that was a comment about what has been, but going forward, this is already being refined and will continue to be refined. So it looks like the data will be come out more quickly in future. Yeah, I can't tell you about the, the, the time lag, um, uh -huh. but this is, this is an, actually, it's a very important, more general question, um, which is the, the timing of availability of of, of data. Um, so that is specifically with regard to SEPA, and um, and they, uh, I believe, are thinking about the timing. But you also have um, data held by the registers of Scotland, uh, and they have a quarterly reporting pattern. Uh, and does that pattern suit, you know, in other words, what are the times when we all need data, and what, what are the times when we need data? Um, so we're in starting conversations, in the middle of conversations, to say this is when it would be best to have those data. You know, this is the timetable for them. I mean, is there a general problem that the data's there, it's just coming out too late? Um, yeah, there is or there could be, and that's why we want to um, basically have a discussion with all of the data providers and come up with a view that says this is when the data would be most useful and, and most effective in terms of future forecasts. So, yeah, that's an, that's an issue. That's not to say that there is a problem that led us to say that any of the uh, forecasts were totally unreasonable, um, because we haven't said that, as you know. Uh, but there's an issue here that we'd like to get under and perhaps uh, influence some change going forward. So I'm, I'm sure as a committee would be interested to know if some, you know, if you're getting data quickly from one area and not from another, then we'd be happy to, you know, make comments on that, I'm sure. Could I say that this is the data as it is normally reported from yes. these areas? Um, and I hear what you're saying, and thank you very much. Leave it with us to have these conversations about um, the regularity of, of data and the periodicity of the, the data that comes out. Um, and if we do need some muscle, thank you for the <laughs> offer. So. Thank you. A, I mean, another specific figure was this 16%, where it appears to me, if I'm reading this correctly, that the actual um, landfill waste going in should be raising a certain amount of tax, and it's 16% less that's uh, arriving at HMRC, which also concerns me a wee bit. Are, are, are we clear what that means? Uh, that's that's, our, underst that's our, our understanding of it as well. There's stuff, stuff being dumped, uh, and the tax level should be higher, but... The, the HMRC data is in conflict with that. Because that then makes forecasting almost impossible. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't, didn't mean no, to interrupt. No, I, and I understand where you're coming from. Um, there is a certain amount of waste tourism, which is the, the jargon term, and that is uh, th those purveyors of waste sometimes cross borders, and uh, it becomes uh, slightly complicated um, for the OBR because they deal with uh, with firms, if you if you will, the, those who, who create and, and, and put the waste to landfill. If those firms are, are crossing the border, it's a little harder to distinguish. So that probably accounts for some of the difference. Um, but as I say, I, I have some confidence anyway that the changes that SEPA are bringing in will be much more specific and more accurately reflect what's happening on the ground in Scotland. And that's the place we want to get to. Okay, and my final point, still on landfill tax. Uh, I mean, I think the point's been made, if I'm correct, that a uh, I mean, the environmental folk and within government, you know, are really keen to push down the, the amount of landfill. Uh, so that's quite an aggressive target. And then the, the finance, John Swinney and so on, are basically reflecting that in the budget. So it, the two are exactly the same. Now, that gives for consistent government, I would accept. I suppose my question is, should the two be exactly the same? Or, or I mean, should the environmental folk be aggressive and the finance folk should be cautious? We've, we've had um, some conversations. That's a very, very good question um, as well. Um, aggressive and cautious. We, we spoke, I think, Andrew, you were the one who, who prompted some of the early discussion about the fact that the model took a straight line approach, that by X year we should have, you know, you know, only this amount going to 
landfill, and here's where we are now, and there has been some progress because of the escalation of the taxes that has had an impact, behavioral impact, um, and and therefore, what else do you do but sh but show a straight line, and that's really what you're, what you're reflecting. Um, we had a little bit of discussion, so this gets back to the question about challenge and inquiry, but it, which is really discussion, so we had a bit of discussion, what if the tax was raised significantly, would that have a different impact? Um, would firms... Uh, do something else with their waste. Um, it might go to landfill, it might not, it might go down south, it might go somewhere else. And so we, we explored some of those, uh, some of those issues. Um, but in terms of is that a good way or not to do it, it's, it's an acceptable way to do it. Yeah. Andrew, do you? Well, yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is uh, we need to do some backtracking on that one too. Uh, because uh, if it's a straight line or something simple like that, you ought to be able to look at it and say, well, did they keep to it in the past? Or are they slipping? And I think the word slippage appears somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, and at the moment, we don't really know. The difficulty is, of course, we don't know that those really are the targets. We know what the end target is in 25 years' time or something. So we know here and we know here. But of course, in principle, it might do anything in between, or we don't really know. Um, but if we if we put a bit of pressure on and saying, well, tell us, are, are you keeping up with this? Then eventually it will come come clearer. It's also, um, and Susan's right about uh, the difficulties in knowing exactly what you're talking about because OBR data is somewhat different from CEPA data. Um, OBR, uh, sorry, CEPA data is, 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 as it were, more Scottish, and therefore presumably better. So we hope we're in the in the right place there. There's also a twist which. I'm not sure we've, at least I don't fully understand, there's a difference in the, in the mix of what's being dumped in the ground and the tax rates differ on that and we don't have a specific data on that sort of thing. Numerically it probably doesn't make a huge difference but it will be a little bit more in, in where the differences are coming. So I would, uh, you know, <laughs> if I was out of private opinion I would say I would reckon the, the CEPA approach is more appropriate for these uh, forecasts but we don't actually, I, I, mean, I can't prove it yet. <laughs> We may be able to later. But it's very much on our agenda and has been okay. discussed. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Deputy Convener. Um, Michael, to be followed by Gavin. Uh, John's asked the questions I was going to ask, so my questions have been asked and answered. All right. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, Gavin. Okay. Um, good morning. What, um, what happens next from your point of view? You've obviously produced uh, this report to, to sit alongside the draft budget. In terms of your sort of work stream, as it were, what, what happens next? Uh, well, a number of things. We've already had a session ourselves as a bit of a, a drains up, I would call it, in terms of the, you know, what we did. It really was a, a very intensive effort to get this out. Um, and my understanding from talking to um, the fiscal unit within the government is that they are shortly to have their own drains up about the process. I think it was intensive for them as well. We then have agreed that we'll come together and just discuss this and sort of see what worked, what didn't work, um, how do we work together differently, more effectively if we need to. I think our, our one primary assumption is we want to start much earlier for next year's budget because we'll have the ability to do that. We couldn't do that this year. Um, so that's one thing we're doing. We are continuing to um, create and develop these, what I call relationships with uh, relevant organizations and, uh, and, and, and bodies. So I've mentioned some of the Scottish agencies. Um, we uh, will be going down. We had, had spoken to the chairman of the OBR at the beginning of our process in August, um, but we've been in touch. We'll, we will be talking to him uh, more fully. Um, we've uh, had a conversation with the parliament's, um, and I'll get the name of it wrong, um, budget. It's Simon Wakefield's unit that looks at the budget, I think the expenditure side of the budget. Um, but it's just to, to make sure we know what people are doing, see if anyone has ways to help us or feed into our, our work. We've um, been in touch with the, uh, a network called IPFIN, I -P -F -I -N, which is the sort of UK nations of, of fiscal and budgetary um, bodies. Uh, they have a um, a get-together uh, for day in November, 
uh, and I believe I'm going to go to that. They invited me and said, well, let's go meet, talk, and find out. We've been in touch with the OECD. They have a get-together in the spring, and again, they've invited us, and we think that will be very useful because they have fiscal commissions from a number of different countries, and we can learn from them. Um, your own... Uh, findings, I think your February report from this year about uh, as you were doing your own consultation on whether to set up a fiscal commission, you, you had uh, taken some evidence, I believe, from the Swedish commission and from the Irish commission, and so we've been in touch with both of those. In fact, Andrew has been out and spoken to uh, the Irish commission, and we have some paperwork from the Swedish commission. So part of our work is to find out more about how others do it, you know, how we can improve what we're doing. So it's building out these relationships. It's um, um, uh, it's reaching more widely around these networks. It's understanding absolutely fully what more do we need and do we want and, and, and having the right timetable to go into next year's budget round. Um, and then picking up on some of these questions that you're raising with us this morning, some of which come out of our report. Uh, and that is the, the, the meat and you know, the core of what we need to do um, is to find to explore these questions and find some answers. How much data is enough data? What do we do when we don't have it? I mean, th these are important questions for the future. So we will set out to, uh, to do all of that. Um, the other part of our work program, and this may seem um, more on the side, but actually it's important, is as I think you know, um, we are being hosted at Glasgow University, who've been very cooperative and are in the process of giving us a little office and a uh, uh, process of uh, helping us find a couple of research assistants. So uh, we need to continue that process until we are actually functioning there. Uh, we have a website, which you may have noticed doesn't have very much on it, um, but we got the report out at the right moment in time, which to me was what really mattered. Um, and I think our three names are on it, so we want to do a little bit more with the website. Okay, thank you. And any suggestions from anyone about what you'd like us to do, please feed those in. Okay, thank you. Um, a, a couple of members have asked about the, the differences between projections from the OBR and projections for the Scottish Government for devolved taxes and, and some explanations or some um, uh, theories have been put forward for the differences. Just just looking at the, the tables in front of me, one of the OBR one comes from March of this year and the Scottish Government presumably is from October, might be September, I guess September, October this year. And the OBR one is in relation to stamp duty land tax, and obviously the Scottish Government one is specifically in relation to land and buildings transactions tax. Could, could either of those factors go some way to explaining some of the difference? A uh, simple answer is absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure the, the Scottish data will not all be at one one point in time, whether it's August 1st or September 1st or, or whatever. They will have done their best to, to get the best and most up-to-date up to date data that they could. Um, so there will be, but there will be some timing difference. And yeah, of course, that absolutely right. That makes a difference. And it is a different tax uh, in terms of what it will bring in. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, Paige. Four of your, towards the bottom of page four of your report, um, when you're talking about the residential model uh, for LBTT, um, right at the bottom of that report, um, Roman numerals three, um, relatively high tax rates applicable to the upper band of the new LBTT may also induce an additional behavioural response uh, which has not been factored into the forecast. Now, obviously, behavioural response is something that um, we've talked about as a committee and we've, we've quizzed others on. In terms of the, the behavioural response to both to that tax and to um, landfill tax, was there, any, was there any sort of work being done on that that you were able to see or, or are you basically saying there's none being done but we, we think there ought to be some done going forward? Go ahead. Well, uh, so the kind of formal techniques that the Scottish Government are using don't include any behavioural responses. So it's not that kind of modelling. Uh, I think in terms of the kind of housing market side of things, that they have looked at various models which are more behavioural, are more structural, that include, would include these kind of effects. Uh, but they haven't been particularly successful in managing to find workable versions of these. And these are typically very difficult models to successfully develop. So uh, at the moment, they don't have, they don't have such models. Uh, we're encouraging them to look into the possibility of, of developing them. Yeah. Uh, 
add to that. <clears throat> I think one of the reasons why this is not at the top of the agenda, it wasn't in that brief period, is because the, the amount of transactions, the value, I should say, the transactions at the top part of the tell is actually rather small. So they focused on other things first. The only other thing I would say is, presumably, if there's a behavioral response, one would imagine it was uh, going to be driven by the difference in the tax rates in the top band and the next band down, which is relatively small. Um, the one b below that is rather larger. So, I mean, your question's the right one, um, but it, it might be actually a different bit in the distribution. It doesn't help you very much, but... Uh, um, okay. Um, next question, then. The, you, you made the point, you know, we want to see enhanced forecasting methods, and, and one of the main areas is data, which has been talked about, so I won't ask about data. But other than data, which obviously uh, will take a degree of time, are, are there any other specific obvious areas where you think the, f the current forecasting methods could be improved for next year? I think obviously the data one we've discussed and yeah. the behavioural uh, aspects, if there are ways to bring in any of that, that would be very helpful and that would apply to all, you know, each of the taxes. There are different behavioural respons responses potentially to each of them. Um, but uh, I will again turn to my colleagues for a um, fuller answer. Yeah, in, in the um, non-domestic rates, we're aware, without knowing exactly how far it's gone, we're aware that the Scottish Government people are working on getting some, or trying to get anyway, I should say, some behavioural responses into that part of it. Um, so we'll be watching that, and I think perhaps we're going to sit down <laughs> and actually go through it with them step by step uh, before we come to the next report to see what we can say. The same should apply elsewhere, but I think probably it's not as advanced at the moment. Um, if we move on to non-domestic rates then, um, your, your view as a group, uh, I think, was that the, the buoyancy uh, increase for business rates growth, in your, in your opinion, I think you've used the term, it was on the optimistic side. Um, the government, I think, have obviously reduced uh, slightly their forecast um, on the back of that. Can you just talk through what, what actually happened there? You, did you say, we think it's optimistic by X percent, um, we think you should do this, or did, or did you simply use the term optimistic side and they then did it. Just, just be useful just to know how that, how that came about. <laughs> we looked at their approach to forecasting, which is essentially, I think it was eight years of data they have, and they have the kind of historical average for growth and buoyancy over that period. And then they have a, a range of kind of macroeconomic and microeconomic indicators, which they use to try and s to suggest whether the economy is going to be growing faster or slower than in previous years. Uh, and they looked at those indicators and took those to be reasonably optimistic uh, and then went to kind of the upper level of the historical bands that we'd observed for buoyancy. So, you know, perhaps it was correct to take an optimistic view of, the, of the, how things were going to, the economic Kind of conditions going forward, but in terms of the impact on buoyancy, it was putting it to the upper limit of what had been observed in the past. And uh, what we did was pointed out that this seemed to be at the upper limit of anything that we've seen in the limited data we have. Uh, it appears optimistic. It may possibly be reasonable, but it does seem on the optimistic side. And then I think Mr. Swinney adjusted his uh, or the Scottish Government adjusted their forecasts on the basis of this, but we didn't tell them what adjustment to make. Yeah, it's not our job to do that. Sure. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question, then, really just, again, business rates, obviously there, um, there are previous years to look at, and it, and it ties in with a previous question. I, is it something that you would plan to do for next year, or is it something you could do to look at the, the estimates or projections for business rates? Because obviously we've got whatever it is, 10, 15 years worth of data, presumably for that, the original estimates versus the outturn and what the estimates were based upon. Is there work that can be done on that to, uh, to see how we can improve the model um, going forward? Uh, yes, yeah. so, um, yeah. for, for all taxis, we would, we would seek to look at forecasts and outcomes, and the more information we have on that, the, the more we can inform improvements in, in modelling, yes. Difficult thing to do because you want to actually look at the differences and then you need to ask the question why did it happen? So cheap point to say this tells you that the inquiry and challenge approach is actually effective and and then several of these points has happened. Um but uh, when you get to that stage and then transfer it to uh, how much would you want to make a, an allowance in the future for this sort of thing, that's much more um 
judgmental. But, you know, part of our job is to make judgment, and we do that better and better the more data and evidence we have. So it's a good suggestion. Okay, I'm grateful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Malcolm? Does the Fiscal Commission have any input into our involvement with the Smith Commission? Um, I will explain exactly the involvement. I wrote to Lord Smith um, some little while after that appointment was announced and um, wished him well in a, in a challenging task. And uh, simply, and I, I know him, so it's fairly easy to say it in these words. I said, I just want to remind you about the new Scottish Fiscal Commission that we exist. Um, we did not intend to make a submission to the Smith Commission because that's not our role. Um, and uh, we are, on the other hand, ready if they want to come to us at any point to, you know, share an idea or, or try something out or ask us questions, we would respond in that case only within our remit. We're very conscious of what our remit is and that we don't stray. Um, and uh, and so that seemed to be the appropriate way to engage with the Smith Commission. If, again, any guidance there, would you know, I'd appreciate that. But in terms of your other roles, will, will some of you be making submissions to the Smith Commission? Um, no, the I, so oh gosh, I'm just trying to think. Um, there is a an, a non non incorporated, if you will, body called the 2020 Climate Change Group. It's a group of volunteers from business and government and others who try to influence um, momentum on the climate change agenda, and they may be uh, possibly making a statement to the Smith Commission, um, but it's not done yet, and. Uh, and my my thinking was um, possibly you know I could be excluded that that it, it's not even a real body in the sense that it it uh, it, it is an it, it is a non organization it's a group of volunteers, um, and in terms of any of my own other engagements, um, the festivals forum I have a, a very big involvement I chair the board that looks after the kind of. Uh, um, strategic positioning of the city of Edinburgh and all of the festivals, uh, and um, they have not made uh, a submission. If there was some discussion about that, I would think about uh, any um, relationship to the Fiscal Commission and would not necessarily put my name to something. So I don't, uh, I'm not aware of any other input that would cross over my world, and I just turn to Campbell and to Andrew to ask if you have any. No, I think my answer is exactly the same. As the fiscal commission doesn't do policy advocacy, so he couldn't suggest something um, as such. Um, if they came to me or to us, we could say something. <laughs> it's a bit difficult to say what it might be. No, I, th I think if, if they approached us, um, we would see in what basis they approach us. They may not do, because why would they, in a sense, um, given what we're responsible for? But if they did, we would um, discuss whether and how we could respond to them. Campbell, do you, there, there's no, is there any overlap with anything? You uh, well, I think I have colleagues at the University of Glasgow who are making written submissions to the Smith Commission. I was asked to be involved but declined given my position on the Fiscal Commission. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that one. Okay, that appears. Oh, Jean, sorry. <clears throat> Just finally, and it's going back to the, the data, the missing data, if you like. But when you looked at the systems that the OBR uh, employ, was that really impressive? Did you get excited about the kind of detail in the, in the data collection that they have in order to make their forecasts? <coughs> well, the, the OBR have, have access to the, you know, the full set of ONS and Treasury data needed to run um, hundred equa well, multi-hundred equation models, so they, they have a large set of data on which to, to base the forecast. Um, is their, their fo forecasting then with, with that kind of data always been uh, impressive? I mean, we've, my experience on this committee is not great, but the OBR have often been fairly spectacularly wrong in their forecasting. <coughs> the OBR's approach is to build this, this very large macroeconometric model. The, the academic literature has 
performs horse races between alternative approaches to forecasting and puts this, that style of macroeconomic model up against relatively simple statistical models. And over a short-term horizon, uh, short-term statistical models often outperform large-scale macroeconometric models. But the OBR, on the other hand, needs to produce a set of forecasts for a huge number of variables, and it needs to be coherent and consistent. So you need a big model to be able to to perform that task. So and it, it those trade-offs. Sorry, Campbell. It may be worth noting that um, we had exactly that kind of debate, um, you know, amongst ourselves as well, of, you know, about whether one one type, the big or the rather more just the simpler approach is better. And actually, the simpler approach that we see being taken here out of necessity um, also felt quite comfortable and helped us to come to the conclusion that the results were reasonable. Um, just on the, on the collection of that kind of data, I mean, do you foresee other institutions, like universities and so on, who, it seems to me, often do quite detailed research into some of the areas that will be relevant to you. It will, will, will you engage with them? Um, I think the answer is yes. We certainly spoke about that uh, at the beginning, um, and uh, and I think we probably know some of those universities which uh, which which do gather up uh, a fair amount of data, and um, we would uh, again we've reached out a little bit, and that's part of our follow up program. Those bodies that we might have relationships with. We might also at some point want to commission some research and we would likely turn to a university to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, as being impartial, independent and uh, having the integrity of academic research. So, yes. Um, I, I could just add to that <clears throat> that I can think of several universities or institutes which do do some research. Usually it's on one bit of the economy. So if we wanted to look at, I mean, I can think of one case where it's focused on the labour market. So if you want to look at um, some of the factors that uh, are important there and whether that affects uh, the forecast we're looking at, we can do that. I, I'm not sure we're going to find very much which does the Scottish economy per se. Maybe it should, but... <laughs> um, well, I can think of one case, but I wouldn't use that model, <laughs> having been into it. But, uh, so it's, it's patchy. Um, it but generally, I think what you're saying is that the, f the fact that it, it is um, almost kind of microcosmic, perhaps, compared to the OBR in some of the areas that you're looking at currently, that the chances are that it could, it, it could be much more exact. Meaning the, the, the smaller, um, mm. the smaller models. Um, Yes, there is a chance that that could be the case, but part of that is possibly in the data collection and the in the integrity of the data that as it's stored and, and reported. Um, the the biggest issue is actually getting genuinely Scottish specific data. I mean that that's that's really important, and that will help hugely in terms of uh, the quality um, and the assurance that that we feel towards the forecasts. So we see. Um, the way forward that that is what is intended and that is what has started here and therefore that's an important place to be. Um, I think the, the other thing, and I talked about um, meeting some of the other fiscal commissions from elsewhere, I mean, that's the kind of question that we can uh, chat with somebody completely outside our ambit and just get a little bit of their experience, what have they found has been useful. So it's a good question. Okay, that is a uh, concluded questions from the committee. I'm just wondering if there's any further points you would like to make. Um, anything from yourself? Anything? No, I think we covered. No, I, I would just we yeah, just thank you because you've obviously gone into the the report um, in some detail. Um, I am a note taker, and I've I've made a note of a number of these questions. I'll make sure that they all come up on our agendas uh, going forward for discussion. So we appreciate that. Thank you very much uh, for the evidence you've given to committee. This morning I'm now going to call a recess until 10.45 to allow a change of our witnesses and to give members an actual break. <laughs>
Okay, our next uh, item of business is to take evidence as part of our inquiry into proposals for further fiscal devolution. I therefore would like to welcome to the meeting Professor Ian McLean. Uh, members of copies of Professor McLean's written submission, so we'll go straight to questions from the committee. And as is the fashion uh, on this committee, I'll start off. And uh, once I've asked you some opening questions, then we'll uh, expand uh, the session to colleagues around the table. So, uh, first of all, I have to say uh, it's a short paper, but a very interesting one. Actually, Professor McLean, I'm sure there'll be there's plenty of food for thought for members of the committee. I think uh, you, you've listed, for example, your view on uh, on what should be devolved, what should not, etc. But there's one or two areas where you've you've um, left a wee bit some caveats. So I'm going to try and explore those a wee bit further from you for you. Uh, <laughs> to get to get your your views, sorry. Uh, for example, you say that um, uh, the rest of income tax could be devolved. So I'm just wondering if you can tell us, should it be? Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, convener. Um, I think this make this issue makes less difference than most of the parties in the debate on both sides think because what is really important, as I say in my notes, is the marginal principle that at the margin you and colleagues have to decide between taxing and spending, and you already get that under Kalman, uh, under the Scotland Act 2012. Uh, I'm not myself clear how much extra you get by having the whole of income tax devolved. Nevertheless, I think it's perfectly possible to devolve the whole of income tax, um, and we would need to be clear what we mean by devolve. Um, uh, if, if, if it means devolving the right to set the bans and even who qualifies for, who, who, who is required to pay income tax, then devolving the whole of income tax is a big deal. Uh, if it's a matter that the bans have to, and exemptions and so on remain uniform at, at UK level, then I think it's not a big deal. I hope that I'm making myself clear. And do you believe that it should be such that uh, there's control over the size of bands, who qualifies, etc., etc.? I can see arguments both ways. Uh, all this is given the way the referendum vote went. Given the way the referendum vote went, uh, Scotland remains in the UK. Therefore, um, although having the power to set rates and bands um, would give this parliament a lot more autonomy and a lot more responsibility... Uh, there would be pretty heavy transaction costs uh, beginning with defining not only people but sources of income as either Scottish or non-Scottish. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm torn here, uh, convener, perhaps between head and heart. Uh, I'm not sure which is which, but at any rate, uh, the principle of maximum autonomy does mean uh, devolving control over rates and bans, practical considerations suggest that that would be really quite difficult. Um, now, y your view uh, differs from that with the Foreign Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, in terms of uh, the impact that would have on uh, MPs in the UK. I mean, you say here that MPs would remain responsible for the overall UK tax structure and for macroeconomic management. Is that the case? Uh, former Prime Minister Brown will have to speak for himself. Um, but my view is, as uh, I've uh, set out in my note, that uh, since uh, the Westminster Parliament would remain responsible at an absolute minimum for rates and bans in England, or the rest of the UK, and for those taxes that can't be devolved, um, it seems to me that there's a, there is a role for Scottish MPs at Westminster in all circumstances, even where the whole of income tax in Scotland to be devolved. Okay. Now, you, you've, you've pointed out that, uh, in your view, uh, North Sea Oil should be the first candidate for uh, further tax devolution. I wonder if you can expand on your rationale for that. And secondly, um, because it's related, you talk about corporation tax, which you don't think should be devolved, but do you think that uh, the, the, the revenue uh, raised from corporation tax vis-à-vis uh, -vis North Sea Oil should be signed? Okay. Uh, I think the three issues here, there are are, if you will, um, what economists call the economic rent derived from North Sea Oil, which is captured possibly by some of the taxes other than corporation tax. Then there's corporation tax itself on North Sea Oil, and then there's corporate, the rest of corporation tax. 
Uh, in preparing my note, I think members will have noticed that I am a, an avid disciple of Adam Smith, and I'm very honoured to be speaking a quarter of a mile from Panmure House, where he wrote The Wealth of Nations. And it seems to me that, and I'm pleased that it also seems to the uh, 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 Cabinet Secretary, uh, to be right to start from Adam Smith. And Smith argues that rents are the most appropriate subject for taxation and then in, in a modern context, I would say taxation at a devolved level. So it's the pure principle of tax policy as laid out by Adam Smith and his successors, especially David Ricardo, that lead me to say rents from the North Sea should be the next tax base that this parliament should control. The reason I say that corporation tax within a, a, a continuing union should not be devolved um, well, the very easy reason, uh, I can say three reasons, uh, Amazon, Starbucks and Google, and all members will have seen the performance of these three companies before the Westminster Public Accounts Committee. Uh, given an opportunity to avoid tax, multinational corporations will, and given that they will, uh, if a parliament such as this one, or I know that Northern Ireland is asking for the same, were to take control over corporation tax levels, um, there might be some gain to the revenue received by this Parliament, but there would, sure as eggs are eggs, be a loss to the revenue received in the UK from corporation tax. So, uh, I, as my note says, I don't think that within a continuing union, corporation tax in general should be devolved. Corporation tax on North Sea operations is a slightly different matter because Nor North Sea oil is where it is, you cannot pretend that it's in Luxembourg. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think that the, devolving the whole of North Sea tax is perfectly feasible, as well as desirable on the grounds which Adam Smith gave. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really impressed with your clear, concise answers. I do like that, I must say, actually. <laughs> uh, they, 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 uh, you know, I don't always agree with them, but I, mean, I have to say that uh, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, members will have their own views too. But um, the other, another area where you talk about... Um, Assignment again. You say I'm trying to tease out a, 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 a direct answer on this one. As you talk about the proceeds of VAT in Scotland could be assigned again, do you think it should be assigned to Scotland VAT revenues? I see no reason why it shouldn't. Under you know, where the result of the Smith Commission, which is the context in which we are all talking, to be uh, some form of Devo Max, then Max could involve the assignment of VAT revenue. Um, it would give this Parliament some limited control, but only limited because you would not control the rate or the base of that, but some limited control, say, to, I don't know, encourage retail developments in Scotland so that people spent more, if that was what you, you and colleagues thought was the uh, policy desideratum. But uh, I think it's more a matter of giving the Parliament revenue consistent with its spending responsibilities in order to reduce this vertical fiscal imbalance, which I opened my notes by talking about. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, I know you gave us some quite interesting uh, statistical information at the back, looking at various different uh, countries in terms of that. And just one final question before I open out to uh, colleagues uh, around the table. You, you, you talk about um, what taxes should be excluded. You talk about capital gains income tax on savings and inheritance tax. I'm just wondering if you can give us your, your thoughts on those three. Yeah, the reasons are more practical than principled. Uh, income tax on savings, uh, members will know that there has been a lot of discussion between, uh, or, well, I suppose in particular within HM Revenue and Customs, between Revenue and Customs and the UK government, and I'm sure the Scottish uh, uh, government, uh, the sheer physical difficulty of identifying a Scottish source of income uh, seems to the revenue to be um, an insuperable objection to, um, to devolving uh, income tax from savings and investments. Now, uh, whether it really is or not is not for me to say. I expect you have in mind to interview officials of HM Revenue and Customs, and I think that would be a question to ask them rather than to ask me. On capital gains and inheritance tax, uh, maybe the cases are different. Maybe I should have written more carefully. Uh, capital gains tax, my reasons for not recommending devolution, are 
that essentially, because it's a tax on capital and capital can move around, um, you would see all sorts of schemes, as soon as the rate varied, uh, you would see all sorts of schemes, I think, that um, companies would incorporate in Scotland, and the same issue that I raised with corporation tax would come up again, that you would get, to, be, to speak frankly, pretend incorporations in whichever jurisdiction had a lower tax rate. Um, inheritance tax, um, given that most of what uh, um, is caught by inheritance tax is property, and property is where it is, is fixed, there might, on second thoughts, be a case for devolving inheritance tax. And there, of course, could be a policy issue if this Parliament wanted to take a different line to the Parliament at Westminster as to well, the rate and base of inheritance tax, and particularly whether the threshold for inheritance tax should be raised or not. Um, on second thoughts, and possibly contradicting what I say here, uh, I might say, go for it. Excellent. Glad to hear it. So I should have... I, I was going to pass on. Just one thing I, I, I did mean to ask you. What is your view on the uh, on devolving air passenger duty? That's obviously something which has been in the news quite a lot in the last uh, 24 hours. Uh, yes, I'm aware of that. Um, for the noise that has been made about an extremely small tax, uh, see my table too, I'm surprised that there is so much fuss made about this in either direction. Uh, I would say, uh, so my overriding comment is that APD is so small that um, uh, people should be rather wary about listening to the vested interests, uh, and I, you and the public have been lobbied by airlines who would like to pay less tax. Well, that's hardly a surprise. Um, airports are where they are, and therefore APD comes under the Smithian principle that you tax the uh, uh, least mobile base. Uh, I don't think, given that, um, given the configuration of airports in the UK, I don't think there are any huge policy issues. I mean, it has already been said, I think it may have been in the Scottish Government white paper, that... Uh, uh, the Scottish Government would like to uh, reduce the rate of APD paid at Highland and Island airports. Well, I can see obvious policy sense in that. Uh, competition between Scotland and England, not really a huge issue. Uh, people are not going to dry. I mean, it's 100 miles from Newcastle to Edinburgh airports. It's it, it not really a matter of severe competition between adjacent airports where the rate of APD to differ. Uh, so I think, with all deference to the lobbyists who have been lobbying very hard on this issue, that it's not a particularly big issue either way. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, colleagues around uh, the table, the first to ask question will be Malcolm, to be followed by Jamie. In relation to assignment of VAT and possibly corporation tax, I mean, obviously that would have the advantage of increasing the proportion of our budget that we raise ourselves, but would there be any economic advantages from assignment or indeed other advantages or disadvantages? It's hard to see any real advantages. You just get the, just get the revenue. Uh, in the case of VAT, it's a really big tax, and so the revenue income is, is, is important to your budgeting. But when you think about it, uh, do you have policy tools that would make you change behaviour in relation to people's expenditure? Well, you might want, uh, you might indeed want to do that. But what you, I think, what you would want to do is to change the coverage of that and the rates, and you can't do that within an EU member state, as my note says. So, uh, I don't see any huge advantages from assignment, other than the one that I mentioned in my previous answer, that it gives you control over a higher proportion of the tax revenue accruing in Scotland. I suppose the next question. Um follows on from that in a way because I suppose one of the problems about assigning DAT would you know what what would happen uh, in a recession and moving on to oil it's not I suppose just in a recession but obviously there would be loss of revenue in a recession but of course even under current circumstances as we know this year the the, the price of oil fluct the, um, fluctuates quite considerably so how would you deal with that particular problem? I mean, this year might be a good example because I think a lot of the predictions for oil revenues are um, quite a lot lower than anticipated by either the Scottish Government or the OBR. So how would you deal with that particular issue? Because obviously if 
if that was part of your revenue, that would be quite a significant part of the Scottish budget. Well, I start with what the people of Scotland want, and as my uh, notes say, uh, it's well established from surveys that the people of Scotland want this parliament to control all domestic public spending. Uh, I don't think, for the reasons that I start out with on VFI, that it's responsible for this parliament to control spending if it does not also control taxing. Uh, this leads me to say, for the reasons I've given earlier, that uh, North Sea and VAT, well, North Sea is a suitable subject for devolution, VAT is a suitable subject to, for assignment. Uh, if this brings the answer, the, 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 the set of issues that you've raised, that, that, that North Sea is volatile and that VAT is volatile in a downturn, it's one of the least volatile of taxes, but it is volatile in a downturn, uh, then all I can say really is that the Scottish people should be aware of what they wish for. Uh, they wish for maximum devolution, and this is the consequence of maximum devolution. If they didn't want devolution, they could be protected from um, uh, fluctuations in oil uh, production more than given that they do want. De uh, de it, it seems they want devo max. I mean, but but, it, but in terms of powers for this parliament, is is the implication you would have to have very significant borrowing powers to cover these kind of shortfalls, or? Or, or is, are there are there some other, are there some economic uh, problems in relation to that? Whether in terms of interest rates or in terms of what would be feasible for the UK macroeconomic management or whatever. I recall saying on the previous time when I gave evidence to this committee that on borrowing powers I'm a, I was a borrowing powers fundamentalist, uh, and um, I was maybe telling some tales out of school from the calm and independent expert group which, of which I was a member and of with which members of this committee will be familiar. Uh, my view, but it was not the view taken ultimately by the IEG nor by Kalman, was that um, market discipline is the control that uh, really works and that this parliament should have borrowing powers of course, uh, it, the borrowing powers to cover fluctuations are one thing. Borrowing in order to fund current expenditure is quite another thing and should not be done. And were this parliament to do it, the markets would notice very quickly and impose penal rates. But borrowing to cover fluctuations, uh, I'm all in favour of. <coughs> I mean, you've used the term Devo Max quite a lot and featured in our debate very prominently yesterday, including in my speech. But, I mean, you obviously want to exclude certain taxes. So, so what do you mean by Devo Max? Uh, sorry, I was just using the popular phrase. And uh, it, is very, it has been very widely undefined, if I may put it that way. Uh, so practical Devo Max, uh, for me, would be the devolution of the list of taxes I've set out in this note, with the possible addition on second thoughts of inheritance tax. So, so Devo Max is what, what, what you define it as? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, <laughs> if, uh, if a policymaker came to me and said, uh, I want Devo Max, uh, I as an academic can only say, well, what do you mean by Devo um, Max? And then I would say, um, well, this is a good idea or a bad idea or a good idea up to, the, up to a point because here is how the Adam Smith's principles of taxation apply to your proposal. Now, of course, I lot my last question, really, and because you've given such clear and concise answers, we have a problem coming back to you because you've already given your view so clearly and concisely. But, I mean, as you've suggested, perhaps this income tax issue is going to dominate um, to a, an uh, unnecessary or undesirable extent. But the fact of the matter is partly because Gordon Brown has raised the stakes on the issue um, and partly because there are... Every party seems to have a different view on it. I, I suppose I'm probably asking you to repeat yourself, but I'm, I suppose I'm genuinely interested in, in, in this issue. I think, I think uh, Professor Ronald McDonald's going to have things to say about this, but we haven't seen his submission that, uh, for next week. I mean, in terms of what Labour is proposing on income tax, I mean, I suppose Gordon Brown's looked at it from in, in terms of the implications at Westminster in, in a kind of way you've touched on that. But can you think of any other economic reasons why it might be desirable to withhold some income tax. I think um, 
Gavin McCrone in his book suggests that there might there could be quite good economic reasons for keeping some of the income tax. I can't remember his detailed arguments for that. I think it was to do with emergencies arising. You need to have some some income tax powers at, at UK level. Or, but I may be paraphrasing phrasing them wrongly. But I wonder if, in fact, you think that there are any sound economic arguments for dividing income tax in that way, or whether you think at the end of the day it is down to a judgment about the consequences of it f uh, for um, the position of Scottish MPs at Westminster? Uh, I think it's primarily the latter, um, and uh, I didn't dwell on that point because it s seemed to me not to be germane to my evidence to this committee. If asked to give evidence to um, William Hague's uh, committee, which I have not been, I would talk about that at considerable length or at whatever length was, was seemed appropriate. Um, as to economic advantages of handing back, of holding back, I'm sorry, uh, some proportion of uh, income tax, uh, I confess I have not read Gavin McCrone's book, new book, and I wish I, I should have done, and I wish I had, but I mean, he, he also is very well able and very well qualified to speak for himself, and I hope you'll consider asking him if you haven't already. Um, I would guess that the sorts of reasons that he and others who make this point are having in mind are reasons to do with sudden shocks. And after all, a sudden plunge in the oil price might be the most likely shock that uh, Scotland might be exposed to. Uh, sudden shocks can be damped within a union by redistribution. Redis redistribution is very difficult if this parliament controls almost every tax and every, every tax base, uh, which takes me back to, um, just to repeating myself, that the Scottish people beware, should be aware of what they wish for, but we know what the Scottish people wish for. Maybe this parliament should say, careful people of Scotland, because uh, devolving the maximum amount of tax possible means less room for cushioning shocks. So, so last point, just, just to, I think, summarise what you were saying, but your own view on this specific issue of um, the effect at Westminster of uh, devolving income tax entirely to this parliament, your view is that would not in itself, whatever the pros and cons of different arguments about the position of Scottish MPs at Westminster, you don't think the devolution of income tax is really going to make any significant difference to that? For sure it will make a difference. It might, make, uh, it might throw uh, questions on the number of Scottish MPs at Westminster, and again, that's not a matter for me here nor for this Parliament, but I can see that that could be an issue. Uh, I think the nitty-gritty is going to be in the area of does devolution of income tax mean devolving control over rates and bases? And that cuts both ways, because if the rates and bases are not devolved then I think there really does have to be a Scottish presence at Westminster because you know, controlling the level of the personal allowance or saying uh, whether there should be a 50p top rate. There are lots of highly, highly political questions which, uh, were I living in Scotland, I would want to, I would want to be represented by an MP who could uh, help to make my views on these matters known. If, on the other hand, the devolution was so extensive that this power, parliament had the power to set different rates and bases to those applying in uh, England. Uh, for sure, this brings a classic West Lothian question. Would Scottish MPs be allowed or advised to vote on the English rates and bases? But even in that case, uh, if a rate, if a um, you know, given level of personal allowance, say, of, 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 of yeah, personal allowance is set in England, that quite... Uh, 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 severely constrains the freedom, I think, of this Parliament to set a different rate of personal allowance to avoid gaming behaviour. And as, 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 as we all know in matters of income tax, it's the rich who are in, best, in the best position to game. People will suddenly turn out to have a house in Scotland if it benefits their tax uh, position, or, or in England if, 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 if that way works. Uh, so I think... I'm, members will be aware that I'm thinking on my feet here, but I think that in either case, there remains a case for having Scottish MPs in Westminster. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jamie, to be followed by Michael. Thank you. Uh, can we want to turn back to the issue that uh, you raised, convener, in which the part of your paper, Professor McLean, where you uh, 
uh, suggest that uh, control of North Sea oil should be the, the first candidate for further tax devolution. That tallies with evidence given from the uh, Chartered Institute of Taxation, Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, the Treasury Select Committee uh, yesterday. But And this question isn't meant facetiously, it's meant quite generally. You obviously don't literally mean uh, the North Sea. Presumably you mean that we should control uh, taxation of resources that are within Scottish jurisdiction. I did mean that, yes. Apologies for the shorthand. No, no that, that's OK. But it does beget, I think, a, a more serious uh, question. You know, control of tax uh, is all well and good, but should we also control the licensing regime for the extraction of such resources? Uh, it would make sense that the one should go with the other as part of the overriding uh, picture that tax and, spend, tax and spend responsibility should go together. In practice, uh, it would be hard to unwind any promises given by the UK government to companies uh, exploring uh, in the North Sea uh, because, yeah. pardon? Or elsewhere. <laughs> or, or, elsewhere. or elsewhere, yeah, I mean, yes, uh, West of Shetland, whatever, um, uh, the, same, the same issues apply. Uh, should this parliament want to give new incentives to encourage exploration, I don't know if that was the question behind the question, um, I would be fine by that. Of course, new incentives mean less tax, at least in the short run, less tax receipts. Yes, and I was also thinking there may be areas that thus far the UK government have decided shouldn't be uh, uh, utilising the Scottish Parliament. Scottish government may take a perspective that they should continue not to be uh, utilised or maybe they, they should be, I suppose, is the, the second point. I'm thinking specifically on based uh, extraction of resources that's currently go through a licensing uh, arrangement and perhaps the Scottish Parliament would say, well, we don't want to do that, or maybe we do, or I'm also uh -huh. thinking the convener might have a perspective this. There's apparently uh, deposits in the Firth of Clyde which haven't been utilised. Maybe we would decide that's OK, or maybe we would decide, no, actually, we would like to, to utilise them. Um, I'm out of my comfort zone here, colleagues, because uh, this is into the nitty-gritty of oil taxation, and although I don't know the answer, I know a man who does, and um, I think uh, that uh, Professor Kemp of Aberdeen, who's very well known to all of you, would be the right person to pose these questions to. I would be surprised if there is any source that there's a policy decision at any, by any government not to have exploited, but... I'm outside my area of knowledge here. Oh, okay, that, that, that's fair enough. It turned to VAT. This might be a, a moot point, but I was getting a sense that uh, if there wasn't the restriction uh, that uh, VAT couldn't be set at differential rates uh, in, within a member state, would you be recommending that it should be devolved? If there wasn't a restriction, then the issues with VAT would become the same as the issues with excises, tax and tobacco and alcohol and, and, and petrol and so on. And the issues with those, although I don't mention them in this paper, I've mentioned them in other stuff I've written, is that um, although it's mitigated by the thinly populated border between Scotland and England, nevertheless, if rates vary only by a penny or two, you're going to get people who drive 100 miles from Glasgow to Carlisle or 150 miles from Manchester to Gretna to profit from a lower rate. Um, and in one perspective, that's all very, all very fine. If, if this parliament is the one that gains the revenue from, say, having a lower excise, then uh, it might not worry too much about the fact that tax receipts in the current UK as a whole have gone down. Uh, where it would be more difficult, and I accept that this is more about excises than about uh, taxation, is were this parliament to decide to um, uh, uh, levy higher excise on, on behaviour that it would like to curtail, like smoking too much or drinking too much or driving too much, then um, instead of there being you know, an enormous hypermarket at Gretna, there would be an enormous hypermarket at Carlisle, and people would drive from Glasgow to take advantage of the lower rates. Um, where VAT allowed to vary, you would get the same sort of thing times about five or ten, because VAT is five or ten times bigger than excises. Somewhat hypothetical anyway, but to take on the idea of assignment, and you, you've already talked, I suppose the, the rationale there is that the 
part the Scottish Government could try and influence behaviour that could increase uh, revenue. I mean, how effectively equipped are we to do that? Uh, we have to be very pedantic here. This Parliament may increase rates, which may or may not increase revenue. Um, I'm, I'm aware of discussion about, let's say, imposing a minimum unit price on alcohol or, or, or other, other devices to uh, uh, encourage pro-social behaviour. Um, uh, I just think it's a fact about the world that this Parliament's power to control behaviour by this sort of means is not unlimited because people will go somewhere where the tax rate is less to get their uh, spirits and, and, and cigarettes. That's a fact about the world which this Parliament can't really do anything about. Okay. <coughs> if, if VAT was, uh, the revenue was assigned, should then uh, the Parliament, this Parliament and the Scottish Government, albeit would have be responsible for setting the rate, should it have some form of statutory rate to be consulted on the rate? Uh, that might be a very sensible thing to ask for, yes. Okay. That was a very concise answer, but thank you for it. <laughs> uh, and my last uh, question, uh, in terms of the implications of, of further financial powers for the, the role of revenue Scotland, you, you suggest, you say it could make sense that other taxes should continue to be collected by HMRC, but I just wonder, isn't there a slight concern there that... Uh, you know, HMRC isn't in the, the legislative competence of this Parliament. So if we had taxes that we were responsible for legislating for, but we couldn't legislate for HMRC, is there not a slight concern there? Or would you suggest that HMRC, HMRC should become a, a shared legislative competence, although there might be difficulties there? Or would it not be easier to go back to what I think has been what everyone has, has thought would happen, is that the role of revenue Scotland should be enhanced to deal with the further devolution of, of taxes? Uh, well, my answer on that was only driven by uh, uh, what, we, what academics call barefoot empiricism. I looked on Revenue Scotland's website and I found that it isn't there yet. And if it hasn't even got a website yet and it's got a few hundred million pounds of taxes uh, uh, coming its way very soon, uh, then I don't think it's quite ready to deal with 10 billion of receipts of income tax. So it's a purely practical suggestion. Uh, agency agreements between, uh, as it might be, HMRC and Revenue Scotland uh, would be very easy. I, I can't imagine they... I wouldn't think they would require parliamentary authority, but if they did require parliamentary authority, then the Sewell motion procedure uh, would be very easy to apply. Yeah, I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, we, we as a, a committee, we've got a, a scrutiny role and we could probably find it easier to scrutinise Revenue Scotland, which, after all, is a, a creature of statute that's been created out of this body, was HMRC. Isn't, and it, it was interesting, your answer there almost could be taken to say, well, actually, the answer is then that you do need to just enhance the, the responsibility of, of Revenue Scotland. So that, that is a possibility still then. That's up, that's up to this parliament, yes. The normal presumption would be that the Parliament which levies a tax also collects it, but obviously, without taking any position on the Union or anything, uh, there are economies of scale in tax collection, most especially for income tax and, well, for the big ones, income tax, uh, national insurance and uh, VAT. Okay, thank you. Okay, Michael. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I wonder, Professor McLean, if you could help me to understand a bit more some of the technicalities of the block grant adjustment. Now, we've seen two taxes come into Scotland under the Calman proposal, the Scotland Act 2012. Very uncontroversial, limited uh, taxes, not very big. But the devil has been in the detail. Getting the block grant adjustment uh, agreed has been very difficult. The, the Cabinet Secretary has made us aware of his frustration around that. If we were to look at more taxes coming, more adjustments, how technical, how more problematic is that going to become? Would we have to have one standard adjustment for all of these taxes, or would each individual tax that was uh, transferred to, to Scotland require a different set of adjustments? I think this speaks to one of the frustrations I know a lot of people have, which is that currently uh, what, how Barnet works, what Barnet consequentials and so on, is entirely in the hands of HM Treasury. Uh, 
uh, it's it's not statutory, and if say this parliament or this government doesn't like what HM Treasury is doing, there are currently, to my knowledge, no mechanisms except perhaps the joint ministerial uh, committee uh, uh, to pursue that. So I would rather have some neutral ring holder. I've written about this elsewhere, not in this evidence. Uh, the example I would commend to this committee would be the Commonwealth Grants Commission in Australia, which is uh, not controlled by the what they call Commonwealth government, nor by the states, uh, although it's licensed by all nine of those bodies to, to make allocations. Uh, and if the future of block grant remains in question, I think it would be desirable for it to be controlled by a public body of some sort, which was not an agency of one of the parties to the argument. So, uh, to brought under some sort of joint control of, say, <coughs> Scottish, Northern Irish, Welsh, and UK parliaments. Of course, I can see very quickly down the road, there would be a question of, do they have equal votes, or does the UK have more votes than the others? And I don't have an immediate answer to that question. Yeah. I mean, obviously... The We've had a, a look at the issue of the, the Welsh Assembly's perspective on, on Barnet. Uh, do you have sympathy with their position? I have sympathy with their position as regards Wales, uh, because their position as regards Wales is very clear, which is that uh, Wales does disproportionately badly out of Barnet, given how poor it is. And so they are quite clear that they would prefer a needs-based uh, assessment. Now, this question, as members will know, was also aired in the Carmen <coughs> process in Scotland. And Carmen, and advising it, the independent expert group, did not say that it wanted a needs assessment to replace Barnard. <coughs> Excuse me. As everybody in this room knows, uh, on a plausible needs assessment, the block grant coming to Scotland would be less than under the present arrangement. Yeah, uh if we were to continue down this road, though, the idea that, that somehow Barnet could remain unchanged, do you consider that to be a conceivable prospect? I mean, can people who argue for Devo Max also raise, ring alarm bells because it's going to have an implication for Barnet, with any justification? Yes, I think there are two almost balanced fallacies here on opposite side. There's the fallacy made by people who... Um, uh, I'm not going to be partisan, but people who appear, appear in Scotland very shortly before a referendum and make a vow which contains two inconsistent promises, one that uh, the fiscal autonomy of this parliament will be increased and two that Barnet will be protected. At some level, these promises are incompatible and you would need to interrogate the people who made the vow to see which one of those they really meant. On the other hand, uh, to be fair in my condemnation all round, uh, it is... Uh, inconsistent to demand maximum possible devolution of taxation, including taxation of, for instance, North Sea oil receipts, and at the same time ask to be protected from the consequences of that devolution by having Barnet-type transfers. That's a fair answer. Thanks very much, convener. Okay, thank you. John? Okay, thanks, convener. Um, mm. Just one of the things I don't think has been mentioned so far, you, you, you say in the, in the kind of bullet points in your executive summary, uh, you mentioned unfavourable unfavorable demographics uh, for Scotland um, if we wanted to take full control of social protection. Can you expand on what you mean by unfavourable demographics? I mean the unfavourable post-65 demographics that have been much discussed in the last uh, six months. That the uh, pension age population as a proportion of the population is somewhat higher and the projections going forward are somewhat less favourable for Scotland than for the UK as a whole. There's also a related question uh, that uh, morbidity, chronic disease, uh, is worse in Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are slightly, I mean, they're, they're, they're similar policy issues, uh, but uh, you can do something about disease in Scotland. You can't do anything about the age structure of the Scottish population, not in the short term. And so if you take on responsibility for social protection, 
uh, then you, you take on at the margin finding the money to pay for it. And that is a policy yes. choice, which is not for the likes of me to say whether this Parliament should take. So are we saying that at the moment Scotland spends less proportionately on social protection than the rest of the UK does, but that in future there's a risk that that would switch? No, I'm not saying that exactly. I'm saying at the moment social protection, as you all know, is predominantly reserved uh, matter, and therefore the risk, uh, or the, the shock, if you will, of Scotland having an older and worse health population is absorbed at UK level. Mm -hmm. If this function is devolved, then it is for Scotland to meet out of its own resources. But presumably, I mean, it could work both ways, because, I mean, generally our people, certainly my constituents, are dying earlier, so there's a risk that they're going to live longer and that would cost us more. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, we also have extreme ill health, so there's a, an opportunity that we improve the ill health and benefit from that. So, so there'll be kind of arguments on both sides, is that the case? Oh, yes, there could be arguments on both sides. Um, uh, I don't think any politician is going to say, come to Scotland so that you can die earlier, but I <laughs> realise that is not what you, what you just, uh, what you just no, said. No, we actually only have to travel on a railway line through Glasgow and you die earlier. But um, switching on to uh, North Sea Ireland, such like, the, the whole question of, I mean, you actually were in favour of uh, that because it's linked to rent, um, which I'll come back to again, but usually the argument against that is volatility, but Again, presumably the volatility can work both ways. I mean, if, if the projections for future oil revenues are lower, and then there's more opportunity that we might gain from having the revenues, but if the projections agreed were higher, the risk is that we would lose. So, it, again, it could work either way and really depends on how the adjustment was made. Is of course right? it can, yes, yes. It can work either way. If, uh, and if, uh, if receipts from North Sea Oil are, are, are devolved and they go up, then th then this Parliament and the people of Scotland are in a good place. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think there would be any question of adjusting... Well, uh, we would have to see what formula succeeded Barnet, but if, if any formula that succeeded Barnet was based on needs, then uh, an upsurge in oil revenue would be, on the face of it, irrelevant. But also, I think formula funding would become a very small part of the finance available to this parliament were uh, there to be any form of Devo Max, as defined not by me, but by the <coughs> politicians who agreed what it meant, what perhaps it meant at exactly the end is. of the Smith process. I mean, I'm interested in your argument that, uh, and based on Adam Smith, that the, the rent side is the, is the kind of one we should emphasise. And, and we've tended to, in this paper and elsewhere, look at existing taxes and who controls them. We haven't maybe looked so much at possible new taxes. I mean, firstly, would you argue that we should actually move all taxes towards the rent end? And, I mean, something like land value tax has been suggested over the years. It, I mean, is that something that, that we could or we should be able to introduce in Scotland rather than just moving around the existing taxes? Uh, <coughs> I'm laughing slightly because to be in favour of land value tax in some quarters is taken as a sign of madness. Uh, in fact, the arguments for land value tax are perfectly sane, and they were made by Adam Smith, and they were made by David Ricardo. Uh, land value tax has been taken over by some people who might be regarded as rather cranky, but the underlying arguments are good. Um, were this parliament to move towards a land value tax, it would be... I assume, substituting that for council tax and uh, business Possibly, rates, yes. uh -huh. which are the existing taxes on land and property. Um, speaking only as somebody interested in tax structure, uh, I would be delighted if this parliament did that because I think the, the underlying economic arguments for land value tax are sound. Uh, the parliament will, would come, already has come under immense pressure, I know, from... Um, uh, interests and lobbyists in this area uh, but uh, I, let me say I am a huge fan of the work of uh, Andy Whiteman in this area which who will be known to all of you and uh, on that matter uh, I suggest you ask him Okay, well, another, you're giving us a lot of suggestions for future uh, <laughs> witnesses I have to say um, one of the things you said was if there's more devolution there's less room for cushioning the shocks well 
I, I guess that would be true if it's an external to the UK shock, but if it was an internal shock coming from Westminster, presumably devolution actually gives more room for cushioning? Uh, uh, you're thinking of tax well, policies? Welfare, welfare reform, cuts I, I, to welfare I, I, reform. Yes, OK, bedroom tax and the like, yes. which, uh, which is a currently controversial example. Um, yes, that's true. Uh, there would be more room for cushioning if this Parliament decided it did not want to implement a tax, a welfare tax that it didn't like. Um, of course, if that results in less revenue, it has to meet the revenue somewhere else or adjust spending policies, but that is the whole point of being a fiscally responsible Parliament, which is what underlines my whole remarks. And the final thing was uh, HMRC has already been mentioned um, and Revenue Scotland and so on. I mean, when we did put out the, the bids for the, the previous taxes, in fact, it seemed to be the case that uh, we could do it more cheaply than, revenue, than HM Revenue and Customs, which makes me wonder, um, would one of the options, although you said there's economies of scale, would there be an option, do you think, to simplify the tax system? If we could have control of all income tax and, and national insurance, first of all, we could actually put the two together and have a, a simpler system which might actually cost less to run? That's possible, uh, because it's easier to run a tax system in a country of 5 million than in a country of 60 million. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, we're in the notorious territory of computer systems, government, big IT failures. Uh, and my note of caution is that big IT failures are perfectly possible in a country of f 5 million, as that we all know they're possible in a country of 60 million. So, worth exploring, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't put my shirt on it. Okay, and, and I mean, again, the, the suggestion, I mean, obviously with, with completely new tax, or effectively new tax, LBTT, that's been started by Revenue Scotland. If it was income tax, we'd be starting with where we were. So, I mean, presumably one option... I'll, rather than just transferring everything to Revenue Scotland, is actually to split HMRC and take a chunk of HMRC, which would look after, say, income tax, and that would become the Scottish, whatever we called it in Scotland. Uh, do, you, do you think that's an option? Well, you should take advice from the revenue authorities. My understanding is this already happens um, in the sense that uh, HMRC is organised, uh, the tax raising function is organised tax by tax more than it is region by region. And so there are people who collect income tax, and there's a different sort of people who collect um, stamp duty land tax and so on. Uh, and I would believe, I don't want to detain the committee, but this actually goes all the way back to Robert Peel in 1842, uh, when income tax was introduced, and before him to William Pitt in 1799, I think, who wanted to ensure that uh, there was a different administration for each tax on the principle in those days that... Um, uh, a gentleman should not be interrogated by a tax collector as to the whole uh, set of his income. Uh, so I think, although you should take a, evidence from the tax authorities, that uh, HMRC is already organised functionally rather than regionally. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, thank you very much. And it's Gavin to be followed by Jean. Yeah, thank you. Um, Professor McLean, can you maybe just talk through very briefly what is happening on Table 1 um, of your submission, you basically are talking about the vertical fiscal imbalance, which I think is I think one of the priorities you want to deal with. Just to try and get my head around the figures, if, if we take the UK, which is helpfully in red, or at least on, on my copy, 36.4 um, for central revenue and 4.2 for subnational revenue. Above that, Spain is 22.7 and 12.2. Yet the vertical fiscal imbalance at the end, uh, Spain and the UK are fairly similar. Can you just talk me through how, how those figures? Yes, come out? with pleasure. <clears throat> I took there are there are different ways of measuring VFI, and for this purpose, I just took the simplest possible, which is in effect to subtract column two from column four. So um, 14.5 minus 4.2 is 10.3, and in the row above, 22.6 minus 12.2 is 10. Point, well, there's a rounding error there, but it's, it rounds to 10.5. Um, one problem is that the year for which these data were taken, and I took this year because this was work at the time in connection with Kalman, was 
the depth of the um, financial crisis in all OECD member states. And so in every single case, you will notice that spending exceeds revenue. Uh, or every country in this table was in deficit in that particular year. Uh, but that doesn't affect the general principle that uh, one way to measure this is simply that difference. And I mean, there are more complicated ways, but I went for the simplest. Uh, and so what drives the relatively high UK figure is actually that subnational revenue is such a low proportion of revenue collection that in the UK essentially it's only council tax and business rates that are uh, levied by bodies lower than uh, uh, UK Parliament. This is changing in relation to Scotland, but um, as Scotland is only 10% of the UK, that the changes that we've been discussing in this session wouldn't change, wouldn't in themselves change that number all that much. Okay, that's helpful. I'm grateful for that. Um, just picking up on one, just one or two other small points. The you talked about in your paper about some of the areas that you wouldn't devolve, um, and you gave explanations for those, um, except for inheritance tax. So you've obviously said now you have a, you, you might have a slightly different view. But in terms, of, for the sake of completeness, what was your initial reason for saying that? Uh, inheritance tax wouldn't be a candidate for devolution? Uh, I was once again applying the pure gospel of uh, Adam Smith and saying inheritance tax is a, ca it is a tax on capital. My reason for my change of mind in real time while sitting in this committee is that when you think about the assets that people who die typically have, in most cases it's a house and a house is where it is, so it's not subject to evasion. Uh, I that's for the moderately rich. I think there's a whole separate issue of in inheritance tax avoidance and evasion by the extremely rich, uh, which, of which I have views as a citizen, but uh, uh, I didn't come here really primed to give them. But it's an area where I would hope that this parliament and the Westminster parliament would look. OK, thank you. And just the last one with a, a slight twinkle in my eyes, I this. You've talked a little bit about the, the devolution of taxation for North Sea oil. Uh, if that were to happen, obviously there would be a block grant adjustment, as we've seen with LBTT uh, and landfill tax. If there were to be a block grant adjustment and oil taxes were to be devolved, do you think the Scottish Government would stand by their oil revenue projections uh, that they came out with a couple of months ago? Uh, yes, I think that's a question where... Um I'm damned if I say yes, and I'm damned if I say no. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the Scottish Government can make whatever projections it wishes, uh, but the revenue will be whatever it is, and any forecasting body needs to make projections in order to do uh, sensible planning of future expending commitments. Uh, I think that's as far as I dare go, given that I'm aware that opposite opinions on this question will be held round the table by members. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Jean? Just a, a couple of points arising from some of the things you were talking about. Um, uh, Professor McLean, one, one was the, uh, and it comes up often, about variations on, on, uh, on taxes across the border and suggesting that, you know, if we tax cigarettes really highly or whatever, that, that there'll be a massive warehouse in Cumbria or in, in Scotland, depending... That, do you think that that's really a concern elsewhere, where, I mean, every country in Europe, the border is crossable at Northern Ireland to Southern Ireland and so on? I mean, it, has, it, has it stopped? It didn't, it didn't stop uh, tax on wine, for example, in England, when people could nip across the Channel and come back with crates of wine, and they still do. Is it seriously a, a, a consideration? For sure it's a consideration, but as I said earlier, it's a consideration which this Parliament can't do very much about. Uh, people will jump in their cars and drive 100 miles for a few pence off. Uh, some people will, some people won't. Um, Scotland is relatively lucky because you happen to have a thinly populated border. Uh, the issues are more difficult for Wales, much more difficult for Northern Ireland. Um, but uh, I would say that limits the freedom of this Parliament to set, as it might be, tobacco taxes. But, of course, it doesn't take it away. Um, you know, this Parliament would still have the freedom. Uh, it's interesting, in that case, that um, your data from JERS, which I recycled in my Table th 2, uh, 
shows that um, our tobacco duties are one, after aggregates levy, tobacco duties come second in the, joint second in, my, in the fourth column I, Scotland as percentage of UK. So that's saying that there's more revenue from tobacco duties in Scotland per head than there is in the rest of the UK. Um, so uh, were this to vary, uh, some people, of course, would drive to Carlisle for their smokes, but not everybody would. Uh, thank you. The, the other <coughs> thing I wanted to ask about was the, the costs of devolving taxes, which uh, during the, the pre-referendum uh, debate uh, were cited as, as something that was unthinkable. Um, but actually, to my uncertain knowledge, maybe not mentioned at all when it came to the vow. Do you have a, a view about that? Well, um, the costs of setting up a tax administration were an area of controversy before the uh, referendum and indeed an area in which I had some involvement because some numbers, which I have to say I thought were both unrealistic and misleading, were produced by my academic colleague Patrick Dunleavy from the LSE. And when you drilled down into his numbers, it turned out that uh, his estimates of the cost of setting up an independent government were actually the same as everybody else's. Uh, it was just that he had put a label which he put, he called transition costs. Uh, now, if the vote had been yes, these costs would have been inevitable. Given that the vote is no, the costs are to some extent optional. I mean, this parliament can decide whether to expand the capacities of Revenue Scotland to cover every tax or to have an agency arrangement with HMRC. Uh, I don't know which would be cheaper. The opposite uh, points have been made in this, in this discussion, that on the one hand, there are economies of scale. On the other hand, uh, uh, taxing 5 million people might be less expensive per head than taxing 60 million of people. And I just don't know the answers to these. These are very quite weighty matters which would have to be explored further. And finally, uh, just on, on your uh, support for a land value tax, um, and I, I hear what you say about the, the uh, people being seen as, as mad wanting to raise the issue of a land value tax, but would you agree that it's, it's something that really should be debated and given serious consideration in Scotland? Uh, and that it, it could, in fact, be a quite a large revenue Earner, and indeed fairer than either the council tax and the business rates that we collect at the moment. I do think that, but I must stress I think that as a citizen rather than as an academic. Uh, I think that m mostly as a citizen rather than as an academic. Uh, but I think that the fairness point is um, that there's a very strong argument made, to repeat myself, by Smith and by Ricardo, that land should be taxed in proportion to its value, and that is the least distorting of taxes. Um, I mean, on a personal note, uh, when I was about uh, 15, I picked up Tom Johnson's Our Scots Noble Families, first published in 1909, which I think is the greatest radical manifesto uh, of its era in Scotland. Uh, but when I say that, when I commend that, which members will already know, uh, I'm speaking as a citizen, not as an academic. Just so that I'm clear about the difference, um, if you were speaking as an academic. <laughs> <laughs> right. Speaking as a citizen, if I had a vote in Scotland, I would vote for whichever party made promises to introduce land value tax. Speaking as an academic, I have to say, well, the, here are the advantages and here are the disadvantages. Uh, and an obvious disadvantage from any tax change is that there would be losers, and you would for sure hear from the losers. I think you already are hearing from the losers. And in any major tax change of this sort, you hear much more from the losers than from the winners. That would be, for what it's worth, my advice as an academic. Thank you very much, Professor McKean. Uh, I was just actually saying the exact same thing to Jim from when you said that, you know, the issue is always, uh, it's not just that the, the, the hear more 
from the loser depends how many losers there are relative to the number of winners also and the extent to which they do lose out. Just, um, uh, uh, we've concluded questions from the committee, just one or two things just to round up from myself. Um, I mean, in terms of the table two, you know, your, your current revenue, Scotland 2012-13, which includes geographic share of North Sea oil and descending order by tax. What's interesting, of course, is that the fourth highest and also the disproportionate share from Scotland is gross operating surplus. I wonder if you can give us a wee bit of detail as to what that sp is specifically and why Scotland has a much higher share than the UK relative to its population. Uh, yes, convener, I noticed that as well. And uh, I'm simply recycling numbers which your um, uh, government produces, the JARS series. So I don't know. It would be easier for you to ask the JARS team to come and give evidence. But I assume and I think this is the assumption behind your question as well, Convener, that this arises because there are functions of government which are uh, public in Scotland and private in England. Uh, water comes to mind. Uh, I don't know that that's the correct answer, and I would advise you to check with the JARS team. Yeah, yes. I mean, to be honest, it was really, it wasn't so much the, the content, it was more the, 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 the proportion, but that's, kind of, that's a reasonably good answer. Um, in, in terms of... Um, uh, tax system. We've talked about costs of setting up an independent Scottish tax system or enhancing the uh, tax system here, you know, through Revenue Scotland, whatever, um, and the, the difference in cost. One of the things Institute of Fiscal Studies said before the referendum was obviously if you're starting a new tax system more or less from scratch, you can get rid of a lot of the horrendous a lot anomalies you've got in the UK system. I mean, I, I, I and I'm sure all MSPs got a, a thing through that said that some £34 billion remained uncollected from financial year 11-12. 6.8% of the UK's, uh, you know, uh, tax take. We're not talking about money which people, which the revenue have said, oh, you don't have to pay that because of some kind of avo avoidance, but that's money that should have been collected. So 34 billion uncollected, which of course is more or less equivalent to the entire Scottish budget. Um, so w um, if such tax powers were devolved to Scotland, and given that we'd have almost a, a clean sheet of paper, not quite, but almost, would, would that not allow us to make a much more efficient tax collecting system? You hinted that for 5 million people it might be easier than for 60 million. Yes, I do think there are arguments on both sides. Uh, it might be easier for 5 million people, uh, it might be easier to chase uh, tax avoiders. On the other hand, the very fact that there are that some new differences between the Scottish and rest of the UK tax system would be created, unfortunately and inevitably, in itself creates more opportunities for uh, tax avoidance. Uh, there's a notorious example, uh, historical example from Northern Ireland, where, um, and this is all on the public record, has been for a long time, um, a, a meat corporation, the Vestis, uh, took, ex took um, uh, uh, advantage of a tiny provision of Northern Ireland tax law that nobody else had noticed to, in effect, uh, e almost exempt their company from tax, although they had no domicile in Northern Ireland. Uh, so you would be balancing the greater ease, if you will, of going after avoiders in a country of 5 million than a country of 60 million against the new opportunities for avoidance that any variation in tax rates automatically creates. Would there in actual fact be more opportunities? Because if you had a principles-based system as opposed to a rules-based system, you know, surely that would reduce the likelihood of avoidance because it's what you, you mean through the principle rather than the specific wording of the of a, a legislation which has tied the UK down in 300 different, uh, you know, uh, uh, tax avoidance rules that have had, they've had to specifically develop. Uh, I can only perhaps cynically refer to the title of one of the works of my colleague Andy Whiteman, who I mentioned earlier, which uh, his book is entitled The Poor Had No Lawyers. Mm -hmm. The converse of that is that the rich do. Mm. And I think I will just leave it there, uh, Convener. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I was going to uh, say to you, though, um, given that we're now um, more or less winding up the session, if there's any further points that you may wish to make in addition to anything that you've said that you've... Um, if any light bulbs have kind of switched on or anything like that, as a, along with the inheritance tax one <laughs> over the last hour or so? I think we've covered everything that I came here expecting and hoping to cover. Thank you. Well, cool. thank you very much, actually. I think we've, we've certainly appreciated as a committee uh, your uh, very forthright answers to your questions. So thank you very much for that. Uh, given that that's now the end of the public session, I'm going to call a short recess, five minutes or so, in order to uh, allow uh, Professor McLean and indeed the official report in public to leave. Thank <laughs> you.